Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced, and you're listening to this week's episode of Gnarly Data Waves. And on this week, we're going to be talking about making the move. Five factors to consider when migrating from Hadoop to the Data Lake House. And, but before we get started with our feature presentation, I always like to remind you guys about heading over to Dremio.com and doing the Dremio test drive. It gives you an opportunity to get a hands-on with Dremio with no commitment and no obligation to see it at its full power. So head over to Dremio.com. Uh, and do the dress drive so that way you can see the power of the data lake house. Now also go pick up yourself an early and free copy of Apache Iceberg Definitive Guide. So bottom line is me and many of the others here at Dremio are writing Apache Iceberg Definitive Guide for O'Reilly slated for early next year. And you can get yourself an early copy of the first chapter by scanning that QR code right there. And of course we got many episodes of Gnarly Data Waves on the way with many, many exciting topics such as making the move. Five factors. That's this week's episode. And again, next week's episode will be enabling data mesh with Dremio Arctic and data as code. But then after that, we're going to be doing getting started with Dremio on episode 15 on May 2nd. Then on May 9th, automatic data optimization with Dremio Arctic. Uh, on May 16th, unified access for your data mesh self service data with Dremio semantic layer. May 23rd, easily migrate Hadoop workloads to AWS with Dremio. And on May 31st, how MSK accelerated cancer research with. Dremio's Data Lake House. Okay, um, that one's going to be a really exciting one. Also, make sure you join us on your local stop in the Dremio Data Hops Tour. So if Dremio, the Data Hops Tour stops at a city near you, make sure to be there. Get yourself some free drinks, some, I think, free food, and also just uh, have a good time and meet many of your compatriots in the data space by heading over to uh, a Data Hops event near you. I will actually be at the New York one on April 27th, so make sure to join me there. And Make sure the 10 one near you. Okay, and again, this week's presentation is making the move. Five factors to consider when migrating from Hadoop to the Data Lake House. Joining us for today's presentation, we got Donald Farmer, principal from Tree Hive Strategy, and Tony Truong, senior product marketing manager here at Dremio. Okay, Tony, Donald, the stage is yours. Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode of Gnarly Data Waves. Today's episode is called Making the Move: Five Factors to Consider When Migrating from Hadoop to the Data Lake House. My name is Tony Trong. I'm a product marketing manager at Dremio and joined with me today is Donald Farmer. Um, so with that being said, Donald, why don't you give us a brief introduction about who you are and we can go ahead and kick off the show. Yeah, thanks very much, Tony. Great to be here. Um, yes, I'm Donald, Donald Farmer, and I'm the uh, principal of Treehive Strategy, which is um, a strategic advisory kind of team um, specializing in data and analytics strategy. I was at Microsoft for years, working on the data platform at Microsoft, building products like integration services, analysis services, um, Power Pivot, which became Power BI. I was at Click Technologies for years, building their second generation self-service um, product there. And for the last kind of six, seven years, I've been independent and advising you know, vendors and enterprises and investors all over the world about their data and analytics strategy. Great, thank you, Donald. Okay, so for today's agenda, uh, we'll be going over why you want to migrate off of Hadoop, and then we'll give you an introduction to the Dremio Data Lake House, and then go over some five factors that you want to consider when you're migrating from Hadoop to the Data Lake House. Okay, so with this slide here, we'll talk about the Hadoop ecosystem. And as we know, um, there's a lot of pain points with managing Hadoop. Uh, and to keep things in scope here, we have Within Hadoop, data storage, data processing, and management. Um, under storage, we have HDFS. and data processing, we have uh, Impala, Hive, Drill. And under data management, we have Apache Ranger. And for security and governance and metadata, we have Hive. Um, so Donald, why don't you talk about um, what you've seen folks in the field say uh, maintaining Hadoop today? Uh, we'd love to get your thoughts on what you're kind of seeing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, you know, you'll need to look at this diagram to see that Hadoop ecosystem is actually reasonably complex. You know, one of the interesting things for me, though, is that while people certainly have technical problems with Hadoop, they have problems with scalability. Um, it's kind of expensive to scale Hadoop, um, especially on premises. It's difficult to govern queries and so on. Um, the two things that I hear more than any of the technical issues are that it's really difficult to find people nowadays with Hadoop skills. And it takes a lot of Hadoop knowledge, it takes a lot of management experience um, to, to actually run a Hadoop um, cluster effectively. So that's a, that's a big problem, just actually hiring the people to do it 
And then um, the cost of running Hadoop is actually getting, it, it's, it's getting pretty expensive for people. So those are non-technical issues, but they're related to the technical issues. But there's, um, you know, the technical, technical issues on their own, the issues with scalability, the issues with query management, for example, um, and the, the issues with provisioning um, Hadoop for self-service for non-specialist data users. So that would be like business users who want to do their own self-service, the difficulty of provisioning that. So, you know, there's a, there's a variety of topics, but I actually think the non-technical ones are sometimes more pressing because if you don't have the staff, if you don't have the skills, it's really difficult to solve any of the um, related technical issues. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and I think a lot of teams, um, you know, when they join organizations, Hadoop's already been there, right? It's a legacy uh, right. technology. Yeah. So they're basically inheriting it, right? No one's saying, hey, let's go ahead and get more on-prem Hadoop. Uh, I don't so, think there's many new Hadoop instances out there now. Yeah, so I, I think with um, with so many components within Hadoop, like you said, the the technical part is hiring someone to solve these problems can get pretty hard because um, yeah, yeah, exactly. it's so rich. Okay, um, so then that brings us to the next point. So if you want to get off of Hadoop, um, what are some of the options? Right, yeah, what are you going to do except hire more people? Um, well, the first option, um, and you must see this all the time, but the first option is, you know, let's just move Hadoop to the cloud. You know, we've got Hadoop on-premises, we've got problems with performance, we've got problems with scale. Surely let's just move it to the, the cloud where, you know, resources are provisioned for us automatically and everything will be kind of automatically better if we do that, except, Many of the same issues of actually how do you make Hadoop perform and how do you scale it properly um, are still going to be there in the cloud. So you've you've kind of migrated your legacy workloads to the cloud, but is that going to work for you? One of the other things that people often overlook is that um, you know migrating to the cloud, you don't migrate to your own specific um, version of Hadoop, and there's many many you know versions of Hadoop out there. So if your version of Hadoop, if your applications that you've built have dependencies on specific versions of Hadoop, then it's actually going to be really difficult you know, to, to find a matching distribution in the cloud that enables you to seamlessly migrate your applications. So I don't know if you see that one, but I see that one quite a lot, but that's, that's a significant problem. Yeah, we, we sometimes see customers want to move to cloud-managed Hadoop, but more often than not, they look for something that's different from Hadoop, right? Because they're not right. happy with yeah. on-prem, so why the, would they want to go the whole to the point cloud is to move on from it, right? from it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think the next option is um, to, to to use a query engine, you know, so a, a Lighthouse query engine. And that, of course, is where Dremio steps in for a lot of people. Let's, uh, if we've got problems with performance of queries, then, you know, let, let, let's swap out the query engine. That's, that's really effective. Um, another approach is, of course, to move towards a cloud data warehouse and say, you know, okay, so we've been doing all this work in Hadoop, we're primarily using it analytically. Can we move to um, a cloud data warehouse? And as you know, cloud data warehouse has been a big a big thing recently, but that's a big migration. And actually, if you have the problem of not having Hadoop skills or it's difficult to hire Hadoop skills, well, you've now doubled your problem because you need to have somebody with deep Hadoop skills. You also need to have people with cloud data warehousing skills. This is by no means a simple transition. It's a complete change of paradigm. So that's that's a real problem for people as well. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think with you know kind of going back to other Lakehouse query engines is, you know sometimes you don't fully realize business value until you fully migrate to the cloud, and so especially in today's climate, it, it makes it kind of hard for people to really want to do any kind of migration because it kind of makes things that like puts their um, job at risk, right? Because it's, right. any kind of migration is just really risky. <clears throat> migration then, is risky, you know, it, 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 it's just, um, there's always stuff that you leave behind. No migration is perfect. You know, you're always hoping for um, better things, but it, it's just, a, it's a complex process and it actually takes quite a long time. The other approach that, that I think is valuable that we should, we should talk about a little bit, um, and I know that we'll talk about it later as well, um, is the semantic layer that you have here in the, in, in, in the center of the diagram. And one of the great things about semantic layer technologies, which have taken, you know, uh, really taken off recently, is that they enable us to abstract out a lot of the complexity of the underlying system, while at the same time serving exactly what business users want, which is semantically rich data. Um, and that's something which is natively difficult to do with Hadoop. Hadoop doesn't have rich semantics, but um, it turns out that the, the primary purpose um, of migrating 
apart from those issues of performance at scale and technical issues and the performance of skills is to provide better information to people. And that's where the semantic layer comes in, providing a much richer data semantic environment for business intelligence, for machine learning, for predictive analytics, and so on. So I think that's a really important one. Too. Yeah, absolutely. And you want to be able to create that semantic layer without adding another layer of complexity. <clears throat> so the previous way of doing things was you had to move data from Hadoop. And since Hadoop, you know, Hive Query Engine wasn't performant and it was hard to maintain, yeah. they had to copy that data into a warehouse and then move data from that warehouse downstream into like something like an OLAP cube or BI extract. Um, so that means additional licensing and, and um, costs that you have to, you know, keep track of. Right. So that, and then from there, very often another semantic layer in order to get it into a business intelligence tool, yep. many of which have their own kind of semantic um, architectures as well. So, yeah, it becomes a very messy process when you do that. Yeah. And so that's uh, well, I want to talk a little bit about the Dremio Data Lakehouse. And for those that are new uh, to Dremio, <clears throat> we are the easy and open data lakehouse. Uh, so basically what that means is. Think of where you're at with Hadoop before, right? You had your data processing with Hive, Impala, and Drill. Uh, with Dremio, we are um, querying your data lake and getting subs like in query performance. So with the query engine, you get federated data access. We'll go a little more into this later on, but you can tap into data that is not in a data lake. Uh, so that way you're minimizing ETL footprint and um, join that data with your um, data that's in the data lake, so object storage in the cloud, on-prem, or even on top of HDFS. Uh, so with this, you get interactive ad hoc analytics. And under the data management section here, it kind of goes back to <clears throat> what I talked about with Ranger and Hive, right? With Dremio, you get that unified semantic layer. So you don't need something like a OLAP cube or um, BI extract anymore, right? You just query the data where it lives, create views of the data, um, like kind of like a, like a semantic layer and grant it, grant access to the right folks who need access to that data. And on top of that, you get a self-service data creation um, tool. So meaning um, data analysts and, and your data consumers can go in and do that last mile ETL. You get all the security and access control, um, and then you get lake house management. So this is the new uh, modern way of using um, catalog on top of your data lake house. And you get features such as data as code. We'll go a little bit more into that and data optimization. Yeah, this is very cool. You know, um, so I should say, Tony. I mean, I I've uh, known Dremio for a long time. I first came across Dremio maybe seven eight years ago when I was uh, still at Click. And when we were introduced to Dremio as a potential partner, you know, I remember thinking about this as seeing Dremio primarily as a kind of high performance accelerator over all this kind of messy data. And I don't think that was unfair all those years ago to see it in those terms. And then once you start digging into that though, and you start to realize that actually you could federate across all these different data sources, across all these different data stores, and you could provide this kind of federated query into, um, in, in, into a business intelligence tool, then that becomes a different story. But then you start to realize that you can kind of manage that process and there's a data management layer. And then of course, ultimately you, you, you kind of completed this picture with the data lake house architecture. What you see there is something developing, which starts from, a core of high performance adds management and then adds you know, semantic riches on top of that. And all the time, the data consumers are consuming away quite happily without any of the, of the complexity that they normally have for accessing all these complex data storage layers and data source layers at the back end. It's a, it's, it's a very compelling story, and it's one which I've seen you know, grow over the years, and it's, it's, it's very compelling. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so then now data analysts don't have to wait in the IT backlog, right, to get more data or access to the right data. And engineers don't have to uh, be bombarded with maintaining ETL pipelines because the data is in a central lake house. And you, you query that data where it lives and you actually get that data warehouse performance on top of your data lake. So uh, we'll go a little more of that later on. Um, so why don't we just jump into the uh, five factors that folks want to consider when you're migrating off of Hadoop. Right. Okay. So factor number one, I want to consider what are your digital and AI transformation needs? Um, a lot of businesses, you know, for Hadoop migrations, um, 
they really want to start looking at, okay, what is the business outcome that I'm looking for with this project, right? We're looking to try to get funding for this type of initiative. Um, so here are some sample use cases. For example, here we have supply chain optimization. Uh, if you work in like a retail, big retail store, um, you want to identify and resolve supply chain issues before they happen or how to remediate those when they happen. And so at the end of the day, this helps increase market share and profitability in your market. Another popular one we see is customer 360. So with a lot of Hadoop migrations, um, you, you want to really get a full 360 view of your customer data and then creating net new uh, business opportunities. So for example, if you are in financial services, uh, let's just say you work in insurance, right? Um, right before an insurance policy collapses, uh, you want to be able to reach out to your customers and, and, and kind of upsell and cross-sell additional products. And if you're in healthcare, uh, for example, you want to maybe understand um, your patient's history and identify their previous interactions within their network so that you can get, get them connected with the right needs um, at the time to get them the help that they need. And um, in the third bucket here, we see simplify IT efficiency. Um, so we've seen customers say, hey, like we have already identified all these use cases, but what we really need is to um, cut down costs, right? We have so many layers of complexity with our architecture. We want to consolidate our analytics platform so that it hits our um, customer facing applications. We don't have data silos and really provide an easy way for our end users to access and integrate data with all their toolings and, and applications. Um, so Donald, uh, does this kind of align with what you're seeing or if, you, if it's different, what have you seen? Uh, with no, that's very much, to? you know, um... You know, what's interesting about this, to, to my my previous point about the uh, performance and the scale of, of of Dremio, is that these these examples, supply chain, you know, one thing that supply chain customer three hundred and sixty have in common is very very wide variety of quite complex data sources that go into this. You know, there's no there's no one supply chain application in, in any business. It's always complex. There's no one source of customer data, so that's very diverse, um, and and managing that and accessing it and making it available to people with semantic richness at scale and with with decent performance is actually really difficult and yet in all of these cases the need for faster and faster insight you know more rapid response is is, is coming all the time um and then you know the it efficiency story is one that we live with every day it are just under constant pressure and the the, the difference that this makes to it the example that you gave of not having to constantly build, you know, new ETL pipelines, you know, in order to sell, you know, sell or serve business user requirements. That's a big breakthrough actually for IT. So they, they, they really appreciate that. Yeah. And, you know, also have to keep in mind there's data outside of Hadoop too, right? So what is the most efficient way to, to build data products without, um, you know, being deep in the weeds of things and fixing bro broken pipelines and spending a lot of time, you know, maintaining these, you know, a lot of data engineers, they really want to focus on getting data faster uh, to the end users and really focus more on high value projects. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in this slide here, I'll just kind of share some of the customers who we've helped. So I'm not going to dive too deep on the architecture here, but for example, we have uh, MSK. Um, they're a um, Cancer Resource Center in New York. And so they worked with Dremio um, and some of the outcomes that they were able to get was that they were able to create a more purposeful and scientific data management system that accelerated cancer research for scientists, right? And, and um, in, in their team, they had data silos everywhere and making sense of that data was very hard because they had to, kind of like what we talked about before, create a lot of ETL pipelines and um, data curation and cleaning to make sure that they can tie it all together and stitch a compelling story um, and get data faster to their scientists. Um, NCR, right? Um, they were um, able to map the customer experience to identify bottlenecks uh, in their order processing and, and were able to consistently meet delivery commitments. Um, another big one for us is uh, TransUnion. You know, we really loved their story because they were basically building out products for financial inclusion and promote economic opportunity. Um, during their talk with us at Subservice, they talked about how they were able to create a data mesh um, culture within the organization. And what happened was um, they were able to um, give build out credit to 
um, sectors in the market that never had access to credit before. So now they were able to um, give farmers um, access to credit, which was never a possibility before. So that's Very cool. one thing that they're doing to build out um, financial inclusion. And I really like this quote from Arfath, right? Um, over at MSK, he said, Dremio is literally going to help MSK save the lives of cancer patients. And I thought, man, going beyond all the technical part of, you know, increasing self-service, blah, blah, blah. Like we're literally yeah. helping save lives. I thought that was such a cool quote. The so human element is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, so then let's go ahead and j- jump into number two, um, the data state vision. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, so, so look, I'm, I'm going to say that the thing about data state vision is that it's that it's a, typically it's a vision of where you want to get to. Okay, so you could think of data state vision as being, are, are we, do we envision ourselves being on premises? Do you envision ourselves being on cloud? Well, if you envision yourself being on cloud, you're going to be on multi-cloud. Or do you envision some sort of hybrid of, 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 of you know, on-premises and cloud? One of the most important things about a data state vision, when I say it, it remains a vision, is that you've also got to get there. You've got a business to run while you're getting there. It's not as if you can sort of create this perfect world and spin it up overnight or, um, you know, spin one down and spin it up and now you've got a new data state. The world is just much more complex than that. So when you think about your data state vision, you actually have to think about what is the practical reality of, of getting there. And um, that's one of the, the, the reasons that these uh, technologies we've been talking about are so important. It's one thing to, to have a vision. It's another thing to get there practically. And I know we're going to talk about the migration process, but I think this is very important to remember that um, the data state is something that you develop into, not something that you just throw a switch and there you have it overnight. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and, you know, especially in these big enterprises, uh, you will more often than not see like a multi-cloud architecture, right? So right. making them talk with each other, it can be uh, pretty difficult because by design, for example, if you decide to migrate to a data warehouse uh, in vendor one, and then you have another one in vendor two, by design, since they're competitors, they don't talk to each other. So right. what you have to do is, what we have seen is they move data from a warehouse back to cloud object storage, then use something, a tool like a tool on top of that to bring all those data together. So it's a lot of data copying and and also yeah. to your point uh, with hybrid and on-prem, some organizations like in, in financial services or healthcare, they have to keep some of that data on-prem because due to compliance, right? They they need to manage the privacy of their customer data and they feel like, you know, if they have total control over that on-prem, then that's better for their customer. So every yeah. industry is different. So it, it's not like a one-stop shop where everyone can go to the cloud. I see people moving to cloud and then repatriating the data on premises, or at least some of the data on premises, again because and very often for security or compliance reasons. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's a complex world. Right? Yeah. So yeah. So once you identify the data state vision where you think you want to go, um, I think the next step we recommend is to consider what is your migration plan. Um, so you know, Don and I have talked a lot about this, but we we think. To really realize full value from the from the for the business in these migration is to take a phased approach to your Hadoop migration. Um, so step one was to identify the business case to get funding, and step two uh, we talked about earlier was to look at your data state vision, and then now we start looking at the Hadoop migration plan. Um, so we've helped a ton of customers and we've mapped it out to three phases and how we would approach this. Um, so the first phase is modernizing your Hadoop query engine and providing self-service analytics. And to dive a little bit more into this, you know, what happens here is you would deploy something like Dremio on top of your HDFS uh, environment. Um, so now you have Dremio in parallel with Hive and uh, you're querying data that's on HDFS, right? And you're now seeing immediate performance gain um, without loss in business continuity. So you can point your applications to Dremio and now you're getting sub-second query um, over Hive and then you don't have to um, you know, decommission it from day one. So you can but, see yeah, value from day one. This is really important to me because um, you know I mentioned that the data state vision is a vision that you have to develop towards. Um, but at the same time, you've got to keep your business running. One of the things I like about this particular, this first phase of the of the phased approach is that even in the first stage, you get great value. You get better performance um, 
And very importantly, from my point of view, because I, my background is in developing self-service analytic products, you start to deliver self-service analytics from day one. Um, and so you already get better performance and you already achieve one of your business goals, which is enabling self-service. Um, now, my understanding, and you can correct me about this, Tony, if I'm wrong, but my, is that this is actually pretty straightforward. Connecting up the the Dremio query engine is pretty much just configuring connect, you know, configuration strings, connection strings, and, and you're pretty much good to go. I mean, I, I'm probably a little oversimplifying, but I don't think by much. Yeah, you're right on the dot there. Um, so you can deploy Dremio um, on-prem, so you can manage that and basically start connecting it using our connector to HDFS and query that environment. Um, and so just to add on to what you said about providing self-service analytics, right? A lot of customers that we have worked with they have data on HDFS, but it's part of a whole data ecosystem, you know, with business data. They may have data sitting in Oracle or in Snowflake. And so uh, to provide self-service analytics, we have connectors to those relational databases, right? And then you can really create a, uh, a more um, a unified view of all that data. So you don't have to say, hey, let's go ahead and and tweak these ETL pipelines or create new pipelines to get more data in. We can just point Dremio to it. And then just you know create a view and provide self service in the form of a semantic layer for end users. Cool. So yeah, seeing. So when we say that you know one. from day one, pretty much or at least from this very first phase, you get business value, you get technical value out of that. The second phase um, that you have here is about then well migrate HDFS, what what the underlying layer that you that you've connected up to now migrate that to object storage, and I assume. That you're the, the plan here. I think I think this is right. Is that once you start migrating off HDFS onto onto object storage, well, now you get you know um, it's 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 cloud compatible, which is going to be great. You're going to get rid of a lot of your on-premises Hadoop expensive Hadoop infrastructure on-premises. You're going to get better scalability. You're going to get better performance from doing that. So you've kind of, but at the same time, you don't need to swap out the query engine because you've already done that. So it, it's just another configuration of the query engine migrate to object storage. And now you've got the advantage of high performance query engine and you've got the performance of the, the advantage of high scalability object storage. Yep. Yep, exactly. So <clears throat> the query engine has been modernized, right? And then now you start migrating HDFS to object storage, like you said. And so we typically see customers go two routes to the cloud object storage, so like on S3 or they go to um, S3 compatible on-prem object storage. So that way, you know, these migrations, they take, take a little bit of time, right? It's not like sure. the, next, the next day you'll be fully to the cloud or on-prem object storage, but this helps with keeping uh, business continuity. And then in phase three, uh, we get to creating open data lake house and we'll kind of go about that one a little bit deeper in the next slide here. Sure. Um, okay, so then now uh, we go into the discussion of open data what does this mean? Um, so historically, Hive table format was but the most popular format for the Hadoop ecosystem, right? So now with the um, modern data lake house, we see things um, going more towards something like Apache Iceberg, which is in open table format. So what happens here is we recommend migrating your Hive tables to something like this and take advantage of um, uh, some of the future proofing your data architecture, right? You get higher uh, performance such as DDL, DML, schema evolution, time travel, and other data warehouse functionality on your data lake. And yeah, this, this is really important for people who are doing self-service analytics, by the way. Um, you know, they, uh, they absolutely need to be able to evolve schema and they absolutely need to be able to, to time travel to go back and, uh, you know, debug with data as it existed for, for audit purposes. And super difficult to do. I mean, it's what a data warehouse is for but super difficult to do over Hadoop. So this already brings a, a huge number of the advantages of a traditional data warehouse um, to the to the Hadoop environment or to what was a Hadoop environment and is now an open data environment. So it's a, this is a big move. Yeah, it's the, the industries, I, you know, at least when I used to be a data engineer, we, we were in like the data warehouse format, right? Um, so proprietary formats. And now we're starting to see uh, folks in the industry realize, hey, like we can keep data in the data lake where it's a lot cheaper, and you can bring, you know, the query engines to your to your data, um, so you avoid the vendor lock-in and, like you said, making data more accessible. 
uh, for self-service. And so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, your data being locked in a proprietary system. And sometimes it may not work with other tools that you may have or downstream applications. And so something that's in uh, open format allows you to have your data as more accessible. And also means you don't have to provision separate data environments for data science, machine learning, and business intelligence, which previously you had to do, um, largely because they wanted to work at different granularities, they wanted to work with the data in different ways. Yeah. Um, but now you can you can cover all those use cases. That's very cool. Yeah, so I'll just dive a little bit more into what we mean by open data lakehouse. <clears throat> so with Apache Iceberg, you know, it's community built and driven. Uh, we have a lot of some of the top um, uh, Fortune 500 companies contributing to this project. Netflix, Amazon, Microsoft, Snowflake, uh, and Dremio. Um, and with Apache Iceberg, you get some features such as like asset transactions, what you typically saw in the warehouse is now available in the lake house. Um, partition evolution, scheme evolution, and time travel, kind of talked about that earlier. And then you also get uh, unified data access with Dremio. Um, so you're now getting a sub, sub, sub second um, high performance um, over your data lake house. Right, and then you also get data federation, which means you can tap into other data sources that may not need to be in the lake house because of um, compliance reasons or because it would take too much of a um, effort to migrate everything from on-prem to um, the data lake. Or you may also have something like Snowflake, Redshift, Synapse, that's you know just recently finished migrating, but you need access to that data. So now you can tap into that data and query it where it lives without having to move data from warehouse to lake and back and forth. And then you also get that unified semantic layer. So now you don't need to create um, additional OLAP cubes or BI extracts, right? You don't have to pay for uh, premium licensing, um, additional compute. You build the semantic layer and give it to your end users for self-service straight from Dremio. And then on the right-hand side here, we have um, Dremio Arctic, which is a easy lakehouse management platform, right? You get lakehouse catalog built on top of Apache Iceberg, um, and is the concept of managing your data as code, um, something we typically saw in the software engineering world called, you know, um, in GitHub, right? So you can now um, do, sorry, so now uh, you can do something like, you know, you can roll back on your environments. You can do branching, um, testing your ETL pipelines on Iceberg data. Um, so then really managing your data as code. So if you want to test out, um, you know, some data science workloads, you can run that on your data sets before pushing it back to the main branch. And with Dremio Arctic, we also help enable uh, data mesh um, so you can manage your data as products. So helping multiple domains own that data. This is all very cool, isn't it? I mean, I think one question I've got for you, Tony, if, if, if you don't mind, is um, how many of your, your customers sort of deploy all of this and take advantage of all of this? I see you know, the data access layer all the time, constantly talking to people about, about these data access layers and Dremio, as I've said, I've known for years and it comes up all the time. I'm increasingly trying to get people to move towards data as code. Um, because that's such a different way of working and such a valuable way of working. Um, how many of the, your, your customers kind of draw, adopting this approach? Yeah, so uh, I can't give away too much here, but a lot of our customers are um, expressing interest in, in the data as code. This is a relatively new concept right, yeah. in this space, right? So it, it, I think it's more of an organizational thing first before uh, they can adopt the technology, but the demand is there. Um, you know, a lot of customers, what we see is they go with our uh, sonar product, right? For Lakehouse query engine, right. yeah. unifying all their data. Then once they, you know, get to a state where they're on iceberg with majority of the data, then they start seeing the value of data as code. Um, because if your data is on a warehouse, right, you're not going to be able to get that managing data as code feature. Yeah, I think this um, is a very exciting development. Yeah, so more to come on that. Uh, you sure. know, be in the lookout for more content on that piece, but it's it's a game changer. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Um, and so let's go ahead and jump down to number five. The last factor here is self-service for data consumers. Um, Donald, since you've worked a lot with, um, you know, self-service in your previous life, uh, do you want to maybe share some things that, you know, some of the problems that that Hadoop users have ran into um, and kind of what they're looking for, for in, in terms of self-service? 
Well, yeah, but the list of problems could be a webinar in itself. You know, there's a, there's a lot of them. Um, but but the primary ones are, 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 I think, ones that people pretty well understand how difficult it is to provision Hadoop data in an easily consumable way for self-service. Self-service isn't um, about, you know, the expert. Um, the expert will always find a way around the data, but the business user who's got other things to do needs simplified metadata, simplified schematics. They need to be able to do um, the work that they want to do with, with data presented to them with their business semantics, which by the way, may be different across different parts of the organization. You may have one set of business semantics for marketing, which are a little bit different, um, say from the business semantics that might um, be presented to finance because finance is concerned with, you know, tax regulations in particular states and particular countries and marketing want to market to whoever they can market to wherever they are. So their semantics may be quite different. So presenting that complexity with simplicity is actually very difficult. And then you put on top of that, that increasingly for issues of governance and compliance, we have to be able to do this not only securely, but in a well audited and well governed way. And you realize that um, Hadoop for all its advantages in terms of enabling you to, to, to access data in a data lake wasn't designed to do any of those things. And um, so really the, as they, the list of the list of disadvantages, just list of problems is huge, but you could really sum it up that way, I think, that it's about enabling accessibility with governance, it's about enabling performance, and it's about enabling not just a set of business semantics, but actually a very rich, complex set of business semantics that can still be navigated without imposing a huge burden on IT in order to do it. And um, Hadoop falls at all of those hurdles, can really deliver none of that. Excellent as a kind of as a dumb data store, but that's the problem. It's a dumb data store. It doesn't provide any of that richness and complexity with manageability on top of it. Yeah. So then you have to really do a lot of workarounds to get that outcome that you're looking for in terms of self-service, right? Yeah, constant workarounds. Yeah, I think the most one of the most uh, important things we've seen customers who want self-service is, like you said, something that's governed. How can we audit this, and how do we make sure that this is the single source of truth? Because, you know, semantic layers, the concept, it's not new, right? There's technologies that have helped um, people get that uh, outcome. But what ha ends up happening is everyone has a BI extract or, or that they've downloaded on their um, BI tool. But now it's like an offline version and everyone has their own version of the truth. So now you have to really see, you know, how do I create consistent semantics that can be audited, governed, and also um uh, secure right, enough exactly. yeah. for everyone else. And, in, in, and, in and it's not just consistent, it's consistent, but also changeable, which is, and, and those two things aren't incompatible, but, you know, traditional OLAP was intended as a semantic layer of sorts. But the example I give of marketing, marketing might want to look at, their, at, at, at customers with one view. Um, and then at six months time, when they're running an, another campaign, they want to look at customers in a different way. And all the time, finance are wanting to run a consistent view all the time. And yet you want to be able to do all that with governance and auditability. And sometimes you can go back and say, well, six months ago, what were we looking at? And it's just, Hadoop's just not designed for that. Yeah. So it's very dynamic systems and you want to be able to keep up with that. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, in this slide here, um, I kind of give a high level summary of how Dremio makes self-service easy for data consumers. So it really hits hard on some of the points that we talked about in the last slide. Um, so starting with the first one here, you see the unified data access. Um, we really helped you create that unified access point for all your enterprise data for BI and ad hoc self-service. Um, so if your data is in the data lake, whether it's on-prem or cloud, we can query that and then um, bring together data that's in Snowflake, uh, Redshift, or and Synapse. And then we're based on open source Apache Arrow. So meaning now uh, you can deliver data faster from object storage to your data consumers, right? So they're using uh, Jupyter Notebook, you know, BI tools like Power BI and Tableau. Uh, you get that data much faster than you ever could before. Um, and then there's a concept of uh, data reflections, which is our technology to really accelerate your queries. Um, think of it as like building materialized views. And um, it really helps get your answers to your business questions with sub-second latency. So in the past, you needed BI cubes and additional data copies and data marts uh, to really get the performance you need for self-service. But with data reflections, it 
eliminates the need for that. And we talked about this a little bit earlier too, but you get that business-friendly semantic layer, um, a modern intuitive UI, um, low code experience to interact with, analyze and serve data. And now that you're able to build some of these data products to your end users and um, domain teams can, can really take full ownership of that data and make it discoverable uh, with tagging and, and, and wiki um, and seeing the data lineage within Dremio, you can start to enable a data mesh and data products within your organization. So now what we're seeing is that customers use Dremio for data mesh, right? You can quickly publish your data assets and products into more of a catalog experience from data stored across the enterprise. Um, and the last point here, I'm not going to dive super deep into it, but you know, with open source at our core, we provide you in lakehouse management for multiple domains and open table formats like Apache Iceberg. We have a lot of content around Iceberg and you know the value prop for open data lakehouse. So I'm not going to dive too much into that. Um, you know, Donald, is there anything else that you'd like to add here? I think the, the key thing to add here is actually that um, there are in, in in the business intelligence world in the data science world there are lots of different if you like philosophies of how of how data can be managed and data approaches and you've got data mesh here you've got semantic layers you've got open data lake house one of the key things about the technologies that we've been talking about today is their ability to serve these multiple scenarios um and to evolve you know through them again it's it, it, I, I would always want to make the point that that Business is continually evolving. Business demands are continually evolving. And, you know, today you might be deploying a fairly simple lake house, but the demand for a data mesh could be coming just down the road and, be, and need to be delivered. Or today you're delivering a data mesh, but for compliance reasons, you might need to move to a data lake house architecture for many of the, um, the the more tightly governed aspects of your of your work. And so this flexibility and ability to, to derive multiple architectural views of your data estate, I think is is absolutely critical and one of the most uh, exciting aspects of this. For me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, another way to look at it, you know, we, we've seen customers um, really use that what they want is a data mesh approach in the organization, right? Whether you consider that an architecture or, or a um, organizational approach, that's, I, I look at it as like the uh, what, Right. And Hadoop migrations yeah. to lake house and warehouses, you know, whatever your team is doing, right. It's, it's more of the, the how, right. It's how you get to data mesh. And so, you know, the data mesh here, it's really here to stay. And I really want to pull up a quote that I read from a Gardner um, prediction report a while back. And they said that um, organizations with shared semantics, governance and stewardships processes uh, to enable data sharing will outperform those that don't. And it's crazy how several years ago they made this prediction. Now we're starting to see it come to life um, with the concept of data mesh and decentralizing um, IT. Yeah, it's very cool. They, I mean, they called it and um, it's taken some time to deliver it, but I think this is a very exciting phase that we're in now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, with that being said, thank you everyone for your time. You know, what I recommend is if you really enjoyed this conversation and you want to learn more about data lake modernization and Hadoop migration with Dremio, uh, we worked on a migration playbook, right? It's called From Hadoop to the Data Lake House, a migration playbook. And you can really dive more on the three phases that we talked about and it'll, it'll cover, you know, the top five things that we talked about today in more detail. Um, so, you know, thank you, Donald, for your time. Really appreciate your insight and, and the conversation that we had. Thank you very much, Tony. This is great fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. And and everyone, you know, please stay. If you have any questions for Q&A, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get to questions now. Welcome back. Welcome back. So now it's Q&A time. So if you have any questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A box and then we'll, we'll route them over and get them answered. Okay. Also, just first off, I want to say thank you. And what was a great presentation. I, I found that discussion like super, like fascinating. Um, so I very much enjoyed it. Um, so here's our first question. So this question is uh, for Donald. From a perspective outside of Dremio, what are other organizations doing when it comes to Hadoop and on-prem data, uh, data lake modernization? Struggling. <laughs> that's, that's the short answer. Um, well, you know, what? Uh, if, if people aren't using Dremio, uh, one of the key things they have to do is make this decision of, are we going to do kind of heavy lifting migration to another platform or are we going to stay with Hadoop and then kind of put it on the web and 
try to modernize it that way. And you see both, you know, we've, we've discussed both of those scenarios a little bit. You know, they try to move Hadoop to the web. They may have solved some problems, but they still haven't solved a lot of the problems of management scalability that the that the that, that they've already had. They may have made a little bit of kind of difference in terms of manageability and in terms of not having to provision their own hardware, but that's about it. If on the other hand they decide to do what I call a heavy lifting migration, decide to move to a data warehouse, for example. Well, they now have to lift and shift all their data. They need to restructure all their analytics. They need to think about how they reconnect all their tools and things and uh, rebuild their applications. It's a big, big job to do that. One of the things I like about the Hadoop migration, one of the things that we've talked about is the, the relative simplicity of doing it because you can take this phased approach. So if you're not using um, if, if you're not using Dremio, you're really stuck in this scenario of this choice of, oh, well, I can kind of modernize my Hadoop system partly, or I need to do a heavy lift and shift to get it into some other architecture, both of which are you know, unsatisfactory, frankly. Got it. Okay. Uh, Tony, this one's for you. I have multiple data lakes, some on-prem and on cloud. Would Dremio be a good fit for a lake house solution? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, with Dremio, if you have your data that's sitting on on-prem object storage, um, Dremio is able to connect to it and you can run a lake house solution on top of that. But also organizations that do have multiple data lakes, if they have a combination of on-prem uh, or cloud object storage, you know, obviously we work very well with cloud object storage like S3 and Azure Data Lake. Um, and then at the same time, if you have data sitting on HDFS, right, you're just now starting the migration to the cloud or on object storage, then, you know, we can also connect to that. So we really are pretty flexible with the deployment options. Um, so, you know, I, I know the data lake concept has been around for a really long time and lake house is relatively new, but a lot of organizations, you'd be surprised, are just now starting their data lake journey. Um, so we do offer those options for some customers that are just starting that path. Awesome. Okay. And then I will take this one. I've heard of Apache Iceberg and Data as Code. Um, could you uh, go through what that means? I am coming from the Hadoop world and Hive. Okay. So let's just talk about first off, what's Apache Iceberg? And then second, what is data as code? A uh, real uh, quick summary. So again, Apache Iceberg at the end of the day is a table format. So essentially what it is, it's just a standard for how to write metadata over uh, a table on your data lake. So essentially what happens is when you have a database or a data warehouse, you just kind of take for granted there's tables, okay? But when you have a data lake, I may have a thousand parquet files that are just a single table. Um, how does my engine, how does an engine like Dremio know that that's a singular table? What's, how's the table organized? All these kind of things. This is where Apache Iceberg comes into play. It's a standard way of sort of writing that information to JSON and Avro files that an engine like Dremio or, or Spark could then understand this is the table, this is how it's structured. And the beauty of having a standard is that multiple engines can read it. So that way your data becomes more portable. Now, when it comes to data as code, data as code is sort of like this uh, newer trend where you're basically borrowing a lot from sort of like the CI, CD trends in software development. So this is things like uh, Git-like operations, uh, you know, doing branching, merging, um, and things like that. Uh, basically, where that intersects with Iceberg specifically is going to be in what's called the a open source project called Project Nessie. So Project Nessie is a Iceberg, one type of Iceberg catalog. An iceberg catalog is essentially in the sense that iceberg creates this metadata standard that makes your your engine your your tables more portable. A catalog takes that to the next level because then it tracks all your tables. So that way, instead of just saying, telling each engine, here's my table, you have a catalog that can say, here are all my tables. Uh, so it basically allows you to bundle up all your iceberg tables and bring them from engine to engine, which is why catalogs are awesome. Um, but what Nessie, what makes Nessie special is that it brings those data as code principles in the sense of like branching and merging. So it does it offers you really two really cool benefits. One, it gives you catalog level commits. So generally when you're using Iceberg, you have table level commits. Every time you make a change to the table, it tracks that change to the table in the Iceberg metadata. Nessie has its own metadata that tracks changes to the catalog. And this allows you to roll back the entire catalog. So this means, hey, I made a mistake and I did really bad ingestion on a hundred tables. Oops. With just Iceberg by itself, I could roll back each table individually. With Project Nessie, a Nessie catalog, I can roll back the whole catalog and undo 
the entire job on all 100 tables. Okay, so you have that catalog level abstraction, which is really nice. And two, you have the ability to create branches, merge, which allows you to isolate ETL work, um, roll back mistakes, as just mentioned, um, create like ad hoc experimental branches. A lot of these things that we would normally do like software development. You know, when I need to add a new feature, I'd create a branch, create like the new chat feature in the social network, and then merge that code back in. So um, we're gonna actually have a, a, a couple episodes on this topic in the coming weeks. Uh, generally, uh, with the, and I think next week with Jeremiah Morrow will be one. Um, and I think you'll have another episode sometime next month on, on a similar topic. I think next week is like data mesh and data as code. So if you find that topic interesting, join us again next week uh, with that. Let me take a look. So that's a quick synopsis of like what Apache Iceberg is. How does data as code relate to Apache Iceberg? Um, and again, one last book note is that while Nessie is an open source catalog, Dremio does offer sort of like a catalog as a service service called uh, Dremio Arctic. So if you don't want to have to stand your own project Nessie server, um, you can just literally one click, get a Nessie catalog through Dremio, which you can then connect to Spark, Flink, Dremio, Presto, basically allows you to just move all those iceberg tables to whatever tool you like, and you get all those benefits that I mentioned with the catalog level versioning. Um, but with that, um, cool. And then is there any other, um, actually, the, uh, Donald, you know, basically, you know, people, there are, well, there aren't many people who, you aren't many new Hadoop instances, like, as, right. like, the, the level of Hadoop development these days, like, what are some, like, changes that have happened to the Hadoop project to help people manage where they're at now? Um, just, just the, like, sort of, like, what is the state of Hadoop these days, other than, like, Everyone's trying to get off of it. <laughs> yeah, everyone's trying to get off of it isn't is isn't entirely fair, is it? Um, I mean, and in in the long term, of course, you know, people will get off it. But there are there are, you know, new instances emerging. I mean, one thing that you discover is, you know, if you go into Asia Pacific, for example, there's a wide wide range of of distributions there. You know, in, in, in Western we tend, um, economies, we tend to have a fairly limited range of distributions, but it has been popular in economies where people can create their own distributions very easily because it's open source. And so there is a there is a market for for Hadoop. There is a, a, a Hadoop ecosystem out there, but most people are moving off it, or at the very least, trying to get more out of it. And what generally happens is they try to get more out of it, they get frustrated with that, and then they make the decision to move off it. Um, Dremio, <laughs> perhaps ironically, given the the um, the title of our of our presentation and our talk about migration, Dremio may be Hadoop's last best chance because it actually enables people to a certain extent to stay on Hadoop sometimes for longer than they may have done while they make the architectural decisions to move. But don't get me wrong, that architectural decision to move will be made eventually, um, and uh, we we'll, we need to be part of that. But um, it's it's just fascinating, of course, because you know all technologies never die; they just fade away. There are still mainframes out there. Um, I'm sure we'll still see Hadoop around for a few years yet. Awesome. Um, any? Uh, let me just take a look at the Q and A box one more time. I think at that point we've answered all the questions that have come in. Um, so what I want to say is, first off, big thank you uh, to Tony and Donald for being with us this week. It was an absolute pleasure and absolutely fascinating. Always, uh, I find just like this whole sort of like the, the evolution of the data lake and the data lake has very fascinating, especially these last years, when you think about migrating from uh, Hadoop to object storage or migrating from just, you know, uh, hive tables to to iceberg tables all these kinds of migrations of these new new things are just absolutely fascinating so i thank you guys very much for being here today to help shine a light on all of that uh, everyone again tune in next week we have plenty of other really uh cool stuff coming up over the next following weeks and again if you want to listen to this again this will be available either on youtube at dremio uh, youtube.com dremio and on any way you listen to podcasts within the next 48 hours so you know uh give it another listen or share it with a friend and uh but otherwise, we'll see you again next week. And again, thank you, Tony and Donald. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Donald. And thank you to the guests that joined us today. Appreciate your time.